Again, let's recall. When you write f of x equals y, the f is the name of the function, x is the input, and f of x, or y, is the output. So when we were doing arithmetic of the function within, that's what we're going to concentrate on. So for example, if you had f of x equals x minus 2 and g of x equals square root x, let's start with x and apply the function f to it then we will end up with x minus 2. What if this output of x minus 2 that we got from f becomes the new input for the function g of x, which is square root of x, which means that you're going to have square root of x minus 2. So what that means is that instead of having square root x, we now have square root x minus 2. This x here is the new x coordinate that you would plug in into the g function, which means that if you want the same output to come out as before, this x would have to be 2 more to begin with, so that when you subtract a 2, you will get the same result. So we did this in the last section, and you can see why the input, new input has to be 2 more, so that when you subtract 2, you get the same outputs as the original function g. When you apply the output of one function to become the new input, this is called composition of functions. The notation is you are starting with x, applying the function f, then applying the function g. It's called g with a little circle, f, that is the name of that function, and it's g composite f. That's how you read it, g composite f of x. Again, name is g with a little circle f, and it's read as g composite f of x. What does it mean? It means it's g of f of x. So f of x is the new input. So you will evaluate f of x, which is x minus 2, and put that as your input for g, which will give you square root x minus 2. So the domain of composite functions is based on domain of the original function, so domain of f, which is negative infinity to infinity, and range is also negative infinity to infinity because it's a line. Domain of g, on the other hand, is 0 to infinity because it's square root function, and range is also 0 to infinity. Now, if you wanted the domain of the composite function g composite f of x, all of the outputs of f that belong to the domain of g. Now, domain of g requires that you have a positive input, which means that x cannot be any number you want. It has to be two more than the original input so that when you subtract a 2, you end up with what you needed. So that means our original domain is 0 to infinity, so 2 more would be 2 to infinity. So domain of g composite f is 2 to infinity, and that produces the same output, which means that the range of g composite f does not change. This is very, very important to understand the notation. g with a little circle f, g composite f, f is the function you apply first, and then you're putting that output into the g function. That's what the composite function is all about. So let's write that down. Our composition of functions is a different kind of arithmetic you're doing with the functions. You have two functions, f and g, function denoted by g little circle f is called the composite function and is defined by evaluating f of x first and putting that result into the g function, or g of f of x. For appropriate values of x, you can always draw a diagram like this. Start with x. f function applies first, you get f of x. g function applies next, and you get g of f of x. So again, you read that as g composite f of x or g composed with f of x.
a new way of combining functions. The domain of G composite F is going to be set of all x that are in the domain of F for which the f of x is in the domain of g. This is very important to remember. Another way to think about composite functions is, let's say I wanted to fly from US to India. So I'm not going to be able to do it with a direct flight. So I will have to fly from US to, let's say, somewhere in Europe like Amsterdam. And if I do that, I will need a visa to be in Amsterdam. And then I will have to fly from Amsterdam to India. And in order to land in India and get out, I will need another visa. So you can think of the domain as getting a visa to enter or getting into a party, but you need to have the credentials to be able to eligible to fly from, let's say, Amsterdam to India. So it's a composite function, means it's a multi-stop trip. You start with the first, then you land somewhere, then you take a new plane and go to your destination. So it's a complicated process and you just have to make sure you know which the first function is and then continue on. All right, let's do some examples here. So let's say you are given the function 2x minus 1 and g of x is square root x. So figure out what is f composite g of x, g composite f of x, the domain for f composite g, and the domain for g composite f. Go ahead, pause the video here. You can do a diagram like we showed, or you can just algebraically compute it. So pause the video here, and then we'll discuss it together. All right, assuming you've come back, let's take a look. Our starting value is x. You're going to apply g first because you have f composite g of x. So the one closest to x, which is the g function, is what you're going to apply first. So when you apply the g function, that will be the square root x. And then square root x is going to write the f function. So wherever you see x in the function f, you're going to replace that with square root x. So it's going to be 2 times square root x minus 1. If you do g composite f of x, you're traveling with the f function first, so it's like a return trip back. So you are doing 2x minus 1 first, then the 2x minus 1 is going to ride into the g function, which is the square root of whatever enters it, so it's square root of 2x minus 1. If you wanted to know the domain for f composite g, we know that 2x minus 1 is the final output, and you're replacing x with square root x. So x would have to be 0 and up. In the other function, though, even though the x here can be any number you want in 2x minus 1, when it enters the square root, it has to be a positive number. So that means that x can be 1 half to infinity. Can you see why? Because if you set 2x minus 1 to greater or equal 0, add 1, divide by 2, gives you x greater or equals 1 half. And so the domain for g composite f is 1 half to infinity. All right, let's see what you can do in the second example here. Go ahead, pause the video, find f composite g of x, g composite f of x, and then the domain of the two functions. We will pause here the video. So go ahead, give it a try. That way you can see if you're understanding the concept. All right, assuming you've come back from pausing the video, f composite g of x. Which function should we start out with? Good, g function. So g function will take x and make it look like x plus 5. And then you're taking that whole thing and traveling in the f function. So you would have 2 divided by x plus 5 minus 1, because the x here was now replaced with x plus 5. So if you simplify, that will be 2 over x plus 4, the final answer. Its domain, again, it's numerator over denominator. We cannot have negative 4 in the denominator. 
And so that means our domain would be negative infinity to negative 4 and negative 4 to infinity because x plus 5, you can have any number. But when it goes and sits in the f function, then you cannot have negative 4. All right, let's take a look at g composite f. f is the starting function, so you are at 2 over x minus 1. 2 over x minus 1 will take place of x in the g function, and you'll have 2 over x minus 1 plus 5. You already have excluded 1 from the domain of f because you cannot have 2 over x minus 1 if x is 1. And so 1 is already excluded. When it goes into the g function, you don't get any extra conditions. So your domain for g composite f would be negative infinity to 1, 1 to infinity. All right, go ahead, pause the video, see if you can do the next few examples again. f and g are given to you, and now you're asked f composite g of 3. Learn how to read and write correct mathematics. f composite g of x, g composite f of 5, and g composite f of x. It's the same exact process. You can make the diagram if that helps you, or you can do it algebraically in your head. Assuming you've come back, let's take a look at the solutions. We have g function first, so you 3 will go and sit in the g function, making it 3 plus 1 over 2. And then that result will go into the f function, so it'll be 2 times that minus 1. When you simplify, you'll end up with 3. If you do g composite f of 5, then 5 will go into the f function first, giving you 2 times 5 minus 1. And then that result will go and sit in the g function, which is that result plus 1, the whole thing over 2. And then when you simplify, you'll see you get 5. In the f composite g of x, same process, except instead of 3, you have an x. And you simplify, and you get x. Same thing with g composite f, and you'll see you get x. This is a problem where you may wonder, what the heck is going on? How come nothing changed? You got the input back. So if you look carefully, do you recognize any relationship between the f of x and g of x? Anyone? Are they connected somehow, the two functions? The first function, f of x, multiplies by 2 and subtracts a 1. The other function adds a 1 first and then divide by 2 you can see that they are inverses of each other. So that means that if you do composite functions one after another with function and its inverse, it makes sense that you're just getting the input back because they each undo whatever the previous function did to it. So g changes, but f unchanges it. That's why you got the 3 back and the x back. Same thing with f changed something, g unchanged it, so you got 5 and the x back. So that suggests that we have a property to determine if some functions are inverses of each other by simply taking composite functions of them and seeing if the result remains unchanged. Whatever input is, if you take function and its inverse function, composite function, you get x back. So you can see here, Remember how, let's just quickly review how to find inverses. If you write x equals 2y minus y, interchange x and y, solve for y, you got the inverse function. Same thing with the g function. And you can see when you do composite functions of f composite f inverse of negative 2 or f inverse composite f of 5, same thing with g, g composite g inverse and g inverse composite g. You get your result back which is what we noticed in the previous examples. So in general, if you do f composite f inverse or g composite g inverse of x, you should get the x back. And you can see that 2 times x plus 1 over 2, 2 and 2 cancel, x plus 1 minus 1 gives you x. And same thing happens here. The domain for f composite g and g composite f is negative infinity to infinity because they are linear functions. So from computing these parts, we can see that composition of function and its inverse gives rise to identity function. 
All right, go ahead. Pause the video here. See what you can do here. Go ahead. You can try it. All right, assuming you've come back, we have g function applied first to the 9, which will give you square root 9, and then 2 to that power, which will give you 2 to the third or 8. Here we have g function applied first, giving you square root x, and then applying f will give you 2 to the square root x. In part b, g composite f of 6, so it's square root of 2 to the 6, because f of 6 is 2 to the 6, and then you're applying the square root function, which will give you 2 to the third or 8. g composite f of x is square root 2 to the power x, which we cannot simplify. f inverse function. Do you remember what is the inverse function of 2 to the x power? Good, it's log base 2 of x. So if you apply f composite f inverse of 7, that means it's 2 to the power log base 2 of 7, which should give you 7 back. Hey, that just gives you a new property here then. Same thing if you have f inverse composite f of 5, you'll get log base 2 of 2 to the fifth, which will be 5 if you simplify. So we have y equals 2 to the power log base 2 of 7. If you take log on both sides, the power comes and sits in front, and you can see log base 2 of 2 is 1, which gives us log base 2 of y equals log base 2 of 7, which gives you y equals 7, since logarithms are one-to-one -one functions no matter what the base. Same thing when you do the square root function, square root of a square will give you the original number back. So. 2 to the power log base 2 of x is x. So again, square root of x squared gives us x. Square of a square root also is x. So again, inverse function and its composite function gives you identity function and the domain. Just make sure you watch out for the domain. All right, pause the video here. See what you can do where you are given the graph of f of x. You already know how to graph f inverse of x. You reverse the coordinates. So if the blue graph is f of x, for f inverse x, you're going to interchange x and y coordinates. So negative 3, negative 2 will become negative 2, negative 3. 3, 0 will become 0, 3. And then the coordinate 6, 9 will become 9, 6. So the red graph is your inverse function. So f of 3, find f of 3, f inverse f of 0, f inverse 9, f inverse 0. And then we already graphed the inverse function. Come up with the formula for f of x and f inverse of x. Go ahead, pause the video, see what you can do. Assuming you've come back, let's take a look. f of 3, so x coordinate is 3, you're looking for y coordinate for f. So that would be right there, which is 3, 0, so y coordinate is 0. If I wanted to figure out what is f inverse of f of 0, f of 0, so when x is 0, take a look. When x is 0, y coordinate is negative 1, so be f inverse of negative 1. Now you're looking for x coordinate negative 1. What's the y coordinate? So you're going to go to the red graph, negative 1, and you can see it's 0. So f inverse of negative 1 is 0. f inverse of 9. So x coordinate is 9, and you look for the red graph. So that will be 6 for the y coordinate on the inverse function. f inverse of 0. So you're looking for x coordinate 0. And the y-coordinate for the red graph is 3, so f inverse 0 is 3. All right, well, how do we find the equation that represents f of x? This is a piecewise function. You have a line segment connecting negative 3, negative 2, all the way to 3, 0. So if you look at the slope here, it's 1 up 
and then one, two, three over. So one third is the slope, negative one is the y-intercept. So y equals mx plus b gives you one third x minus one, where x is between negative three and three. Both negative three and three are included, so you need to make sure that you include three either in the first piece or second piece, doesn't matter where you put it. For the second piece, we have y equals, so here is the second piece. You can see that our x-intercept is 3, and then you are going all the way to 6, so that's 3 over and 9 up, so that's how our slope is 3. Now, how do we find the rest of the equation? y equals mx plus b, well, we don't have the b. However, if you notice that when x is 3, 3 times 3 is 9, 9 minus 9 is 0. So 3, 0 is our x-intercept, so that means we need to have a 9 here, because that's the only way we're going to get x-intercept of 9. You can also write y equals mx plus b, plug in the coordinate 3, 0, and solve. All right, so now f inverse. Uh, 3x plus 3 is the f inverse graph for the first piece here because we have the y-intercept is 0, 3, and the slope is 3 because you are going 1 over and then 1, 2, 3. So 3x plus 3 is the graph of the first piece, and again 3 is the y-intercept, and then 1 up and 3 over, which gives you 1 third slope. Or you can write x equals 3y minus 9 and solve, and you'll get 1 third x plus 3 equals y for the second piece. So an important concept in mathematics or computer science is iterative process. Iterative process means you're doing the same process over and over and over again. So if you take composition of a function with itself repeatedly with a fixed starting point, like say x equals a, then you have f of a, then f of f of a, f of f of f of a, and if you continue like that for infinitely many times, something very interesting happens. Let's go see what that is. It gives rise to something called fractals. For example, if you take f of x equals x squared minus 0.75, and let's say our starting point x is 1, so then f of 1 would be 1 squared minus 0.75, then f of f of 1 would be f of 0.25, which gives you negative 0.6875, and you keep on doing that process over and over again. Look what happens. If you keep on going like that, you will eventually start to see that your numbers get closer and closer to negative 0.5. So they basically don't just keep on fluctuating to infinity, but they actually converge to negative 0.5. If you do the same thing, but we'd say x equals 2, you will notice that the values will get really, really big, and they will not converge. So in general, if your x-coordinates are anywhere between negative 1.5 and 1.5, they all converge. And not only do they all converge, but they all eventually get closer to negative 0.5. You can also do the same observation for complex functions. So if you take i instead of a 1 or a 1.5 or a 0.5, look what happens. When you plug in i squared minus 0.75, you will get negative 1.75, and that number is smaller than negative 1.5, so we know it will go larger and larger and will not converge. On the other hand, if you take 0.3i, you will get a number in the first time when you put it in, 0.3i bracket squared will give you negative 0.09 minus 0.75, which is negative 0.84, which is a number between negative 1.5 and 1.5. So that will converge to negative 0.5. So if you look, our plane or the computer screen has pixels. And if you put coordinate axis on them, each pixel will have coordinates on it. And so if you plug in 
the complex numbers that is that coordinate a plus b i, where a is the x coordinate, b is the y coordinate, and keep running through this sequence, you will see that some pixels will converge and others will not. If you color the pixels that converge in one color and the ones that go off to infinity in a different color, based on how many iterations it's that you want it to run through, you get some very interesting pictures. They are called fractals. So here's the first, here's the first example you can see that if you keep zooming in, like say I just look at this portion here, I zoom in, the picture will look exactly the same as the original. This kind of process occurs in nature, in your lungs, in your arteries, in leaves, flowers. Anywhere you look in the universe, this fractals occur naturally in many, many places. Here's another one. This white set is called the Julia set. If you are interested, you can look that up you will see interesting fractals. If you look at our book cover, that's also a fractal. Here's another one interesting. You can see that whenever you zoom in, no matter where, which piece you pick to zoom in, you will see the exact same shape over and over and over again repeated. So this is a good place to end this section. If you are interested in fractals, you can go ahead and look that up. It's really absolutely fascinating. A lot of movies, like science fiction movies or even other movies that have fancy sets actually use fractals to create some of that imagery.